Today I'm joined by Rob LaFranco, Assistant Managing Editor here at Forbes. Rob, thank you so much for joining me. Of course, always love to be here. Great. As you know, the Super Bowl is coming up soon, and nothing's more iconic aside from watching the game than watching the commercials. Uh, how much do they matter? I would actually argue that the commercials are sometimes more important than the game. The game is generally a dud, though the last two have been actually pretty good. The commercials are what everyone tunes into. You may not be a football fan, but you're tuning in to watch those commercials. They have huge impact. I know I'm an Eagles fan, so hopefully, you know, they win Best of luck. soon and then get into the Super Bowl. But off the top of your head, what are some of your favorite Super Bowl commercials over the past few years? Yeah, I, have a, I struggle with that one because maybe my memory is just not very good or I don't pay that much of attention. I, I loved, for some reason, the What's Up one is still going through my mm -hmm. head, probably because I have adolescent humor, but that, I really like that one. And last year's... Uh, one with Larry David, which um, even though it uh, backfired on him miserably, it was a pretty funny commercial at the time. Yeah, that FTX one was my favorite commercial last time. I also liked Betty White, the Snickers, yes, and obviously anything Budweiser. But what do you think makes a Super Bowl commercial really stand the test of time? Humor and surprise, I mean, for sure. The, funny, the commercials that we remember most are mm -hmm. the funny ones. The ones that get somber and serious, like, I, you know, I have the image in my head of the Clydesdales marching through the snow. and all. You just know that that's Budweiser, but you don't really remember the commercial. But you can't forget, what's up? You can't forget Larry David. You, was it, I, now I don't remember whether it was Cheetos or Pringles, the one with, with, in the laundromat. With the, yes, yes, yes. You just don't forget those things because they, they hit you so hard. So it has to be a surprise. It has to be visually striking, and humor is, I think, the big, the big winner in all of this. I would agree. And now looking ahead to this year's Super Bowl commercials, let's get into what we can expect. So advertisers are reportedly going all in on betting apps and booze and are forgoing more expensive items like cars. Why is that? I guess it makes sense. I mean, if the world is in a troubled spot. No one really knows. There's a lot of economic uncertainty, which... You know, you can look at the pandemic and say that was pretty uncertain times, but no one, other than the pandemic, people were not feeling uncertain about the economy. Asset prices were still rising. We've had a big correction in 2022. Talk of recession, all of that. Um, I, I think people are, are a little worried, and there are things that even during economic downturns tend to still do well. Entertainment is one of them. I'm going to assume that gambling is one of them because you can make lots of lots of little small bets in the hope that something big is going to happen, even if your salary has stagnated or your asset prices have gone down. So, so that makes sense. I don't know. Car sales will probably be down this year, is my guess. So it makes sense that they're not going to invest a lot of money on those advertisements. Yeah, obviously, booze will be big in the advertising space in the Super Bowl. And perhaps the most iconic commercials, like we talked about, those Anheuser-Busch InBev commercials, obviously Budweiser, they are um, ending their 33-year alcohol exclusive. So what does this mean for alcohol industry commercials? I think we'll uh, let's say a third of, of the ads that we'll see will be alcohol-related. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. It's something I didn't even recognize until we... We shared some information on it that Budweiser was the only advertiser in the Super Bowl. Not even, didn't even really even think about it. But you know the the, the booze commercials, beer commercials, um, they're they're going to invest heavily in them again because they're they're products that they don't necessarily cost a lot of money, so they can sell even in down times. The interesting thing it's uh, the, the brands that we're going to see are not typically your mass market brands, at least according to the companies that seem to be investing in the Super Bowl this year. So it, it should be interesting what they come up with because you can't, your Super Bowl commercial can't be a bland commercial. It's got to be something pretty, it's got to pack a pretty powerful punch. So I do want to talk about another change. Obviously, Super Bowl commercials are iconic. Another iconic aspect of the game is the halftime show. And um, the sponsor of the halftime show this year in a multi-year deal is Apple after Pepsi dropped the Super Bowl. So do you think the halftime show is worth it on the sponsorship side? Well, it, it, I mean, Pepsi was in it for a decade, so you have to assume, and they always advertise during the Super Bowl as well, so I'm assuming that that $10 million or whatever they spend a year, 
not only goes to pay for the halftime show, which they cover all the costs for, it also pays for some ad time that they get. So, you know, the fact that they did it for 10 years, this is not something that an Oatly, for example, is going to do. This is, this is something that an iconic, well-established brand is going to seize upon because it just further ingratiates that brand into the mind of the general public. And, you know, what, there is no greater appointment television in this country, perhaps even on Earth, maybe other than the World Cup, than the Super Bowl. I mean, it's 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 appointment television for the entire nation, so much so that we talk about making the Monday after a national holiday, which hasn't happened yet, and it should. Um, so I, I think it's a great move for Apple. I mean, Apple and Pepsi are among the most recognized and iconic brands in the United States, in the world, and it's it's a drop in the bucket for Apple. So they not only get their presence and they will have an ad for sure they are also dominating the halftime show which is always a big draw i think that's how you know you've made it as a brand if you are the headliner of the super bowl for sure show. and it can't just be a big brand right like this works for pepsi it works for apple would it work for Hewlett packard probably not or, or you know bank of america i don't think people would apple is cool Pepsi's cool. Bank of America, you kind of have to deal with it. So it, it it has to be a big brand, but it also has to be a cool brand. Exactly. The right brand for sure. But I do want to switch now over to movies. A new morning console poll found that in December, 72% of Gen Xers and 85% of baby boomers claimed they haven't gone to the movies in the last month. And this is higher than Gen Z and millennials who were at 48% and 55% respectively. Is streaming to blame here? A uh, good question, by the way, Hollywood. I still go to movies. I think I'm technically Gen X. I don't know, but um, uh, I don't know that streaming is to blame. I think to blame is is the content that we're seeing coming out of let's call it Los Angeles today. I think Hollywood is struggling for its footing in the streaming era, but also post pandemic, which of course decimated the movie going audiences they're really clinging to, to the franchises. And they've been doing e that even before the pandemic, these tentpole sequel franchises, the superhero franchises. They kind of have taken over Hollywood as the big money maker, big cost, big money. And I think old, that really goes to the younger audiences. I think they have not been focusing the amount of resources on those great movies that appeal to older audiences. And then the, the, the pandemic shift and the streaming shift Lots of those movies are now going to streaming first because the assumption in Hollywood is people are going to go to the movies to see the Avengers, to see Ant-Man, to, to see Wakanda. They're not going to go to see Nomadland. Exactly. To speak to your point, baby boomers, according to a morning consult poll, 46% of them don't like superhero movies and don't want to see them in theaters. So that's a huge demographic that's immediately turned off by a lot of things that are in theaters today. So how big of a problem is this? I think it's substantial. I mean, uh, you know, looking into it, the AARP did a, it was a pre-pandemic report, I think 2017 or 18 or so. It was about a third of the movie going audience in the United States is Gen X baby boomers, older individuals. So you can't lose a third of your audience or, or at least you have to keep them coming back in reasonable numbers so that, you know, you, you're making up the difference uh, of, of everything else. So, you can't afford to lose that audience and um, they're going to have to continue to produce con content. The point of that AARP story was there are movies that Hollywood makes that are ge geared directly towards an older audience and they're making those movies now, but they're not necessarily promoting them heavily in theaters. And again, is it streaming or is it the pandemic? I, I really think that they haven't quite figured out how much money do we spend to market a movie that's in theaters when people might just be waiting to watch it on Netflix in the end anyway. And I think they haven't quite found their way through that wilderness just yet. I know. And I think that this demographic is willing to go to the movies because we saw huge numbers this year with Top Gun Maverick and Elvis, which appeals directly to that demographic. Yes. So is Hollywood going to change course, maybe make more movies that are similar to that? Uh, they should. I mean, again, you can't lose that audience. And those movies don't appeal only to that audience. So mm -hmm. 
Um, I, I think I think what you need to see is just a, and you you will see it certainly from Marvel because they do seem to be scaling back a little bit. Although DC seems to be ramping up the super, you're kind of running out of sequels. And you kind of you know there's a lot of content to mine in Marvel, but they're going to have to come up with new characters to backfill. You know, I, I don't know how many Avengers films there are left in the franchise. You know, Star Wars even seems to be slowing down in, in what they're putting out. So, so uh, yeah, it's a content issue, I think, more than a streaming issue. Let's talk about the content that's out now at the box office. What have been the winners and losers on that front? Yeah, well, an astounding run for Avatar, which just before the end of the year, we talked about that disappointing opening weekend which, you know, we discussed it. It's, uh, it could have legs. It could, uh, you know, word of mouth, which clear, clearly seems to be good, is pushing that film and keeping it at the top. You know, it, it's truly amazing when you look at a movie like that and a director like James Cameron, where, you know, three, three of his films are in among the top 10. Well, actually, no, Avatar 2 is not yet in the top 10. It's about to supplant. Uh, uh, Spider-Man, I think it is at number 13. But Titanic and Avatar, which is the biggest grossing movie in the world, are one in three. Um, and you look at a director like Steven Spielberg, who's widely considered the most commercially successful director of all time, and his top film is Jurassic Park, number 13. Then you could drop down to 100 for E.T. So, you know, I mean, this is it's astounding, Jim Cameron and and, and what he's able to do um, you know, Avatar, I think we all know, is not going to match um, the first one. It's not going to become the biggest movie of all time. It doesn't have to. He said it just needs to hit $2 billion. It's probably on its way to hitting $2 billion. That's to break even. Um, so I think you'll see it at or near the top of the box office for a good number of weekends to come. Let's talk about James Cameron because that's interesting that his some of his movies are in the top 10. Do you think he will be the greatest director of all time, if that's the case? Well, I guess that depends on who you ask. And if you're, you know, a, a Fox slash Disney executive, they probably will say that. If you're a universal executive, you're probably going to say Steven Spielberg. And then there's all, you know, there's all sorts of people in between. It also depends on the kind of movie you like. But if you're, if you're talking about big tentpole action movies, you're really looking at Lucas Spielberg. And now Cameron, he's, you normally don't talk about Cameron, at least, the pundits and media mm -hmm. folks like myself don't normally he's 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 a big director and he does these big films but not in the kind of volume that say lucas has done or that spielberg has done so you know if you just look at those box office records, it truly is astounding you know that you've got mm -hmm. avatar i can't remember the number two and then you've got titanic and then coming up right behind it is avatar two he just has a way of of spending a fortune to create movies that everyone wants to see speaking of that fortune you mentioned that he did say in order to break even he would have to make two billion dollars is that worth it well you know i can imagine what that conversation is like with the executives at the studio that's got to be a tough one it's got to be a tough one but especially after this and you again you look at those numbers it's like what you want to spend 300 million dollars to do what and then he shows them the storyboard and they look at his track record and they say well, it's worked before, and uh, I think we'll, you'll see more from him. And you named him as one of those tentpole directors, but Avatar 2, it's been more than a decade before this came out after Avatar, the original. So how has he been able to keep Avatar relevant in, you know, main pop culture for over a decade? That's a good question. I, you know, I don't think it has been relevant. I think, you know, it kind of goes back to the Super Bowl um commercial it had such it was so different the effects of avatar one were so striking it was it was one of those it was kind of like independence day when it came out i was like wow everyone has to see that and people were, it was playing for 24 hours just had such a massive cultural impact avatar one had that because the special effects were out of this world he'd really pushed the limits on it. and other directors peter jackson does it lucas has done it spielberg does it but there's something about the way he approaches it and what he invests in it that makes it a must-see. Not because of the movie necessarily, but because of what he's done visually. 
So I don't think, you know, Star Wars is in the, the nomenclature, is in the, the public conversation constantly, Spielberg's movies more so. No one really was talking about Avatar between the, when it came, the first one, and now. I mean, wh who was really thinking about it until the studio started marketing this new one? Oh, this is going to be amazing underwater FX. So I don't think it's been culturally relevant for all that time. I just think he knows what buttons to hit on the special effects thing to make it so powerful and so impactful that it stays relevant for so long. And then people just think of him, in a sense, as the brand. Like, what's he going to do next? And when he does it, I want to see it. I think that's the relevance more necessarily than Avatar. And that's a magic I'm sure a lot of directors want to, you know, encapsulate. But Rob LaFranco, thank you so much. Absolutely.